All right. So we're going to begin today here on the last day of April, April 30th, 2014. Welcome to our um, everybody to our webinar entitled Measuring Pharmaco Influences on Human iPSC-Derived Neuronal Networks Using a Novel MEA Analysis Tool. And my name is Kobe Carlson, and I'm part of the Applications Team here at CDI. And I'm actually just going to be the moderator for this presentation today. Kyle Mangan is actually the main speaker, you know, the headliner, if you will, and I'm just the opening act here to give you a brief introduction to the technologies and an overview of the products we'll be talking about today. And then we hand it over to Kyle to deliver the meat of this talk, and after which we'll both circle back and be here for a Q&A session. Okay? So to set the stage here, Induced pluripotent stem cell technology, or iPSC technology, has really ushered in a new age of opportunity for biomedical research. The concept of generating a self-renewing and expandable iPS cell population from any genetic background, that is, reprogramming an adult cell from any one of the six billion people out there in the world back to a pluripotent stem cell state is really truly remarkable. Furthermore, that resulting reprogrammed IPS line can be differentiated or turned into virtually any cell type, and there are over 200 of those in the human body. And then finally now, when you layer in the fact that there are approximately 30,000 different genes in the human genome, and there are a variety of techniques available to us so we can edit those genes, meaning we can engineer in a genetic alteration, that is really a game changer here for this sort of technology. So our company, Cellular Dynamics International, was founded on iPSC technology, and CDI has been built around these three vectors of reprogramming, differentiation, and genetic engineering. And now we are the world's largest producer of human iPS cells and iPSC-derived cell types. Okay, here is a snapshot of the many different iPSC-derived cell types that make up our product portfolio. And it started back with the launch of iCell cardiomyocytes nearly five years ago now. And we have lots of great data on each of these different cell types and a lot of nice talks that focus on the different products. But today, um, we're just going to be focusing on iCell neurons. So on this slide, I will highlight some of the key features of iCell neurons. And, of course, they are derived from human iPS cells. Importantly, I need to point out that they come cryopreserved so that they can be thawed and used on any day of the week. Uh, they are also a very highly pure population of cortical neurons, as you can see by the flow plot. We routinely obtain greater than 95% purity based on positive beta-3 tubulin and nestin negative staining. And you can see from the phase contrast images and the fluorescent immunostaining that I cell neurons possess a typical neuronal morphology, meaning bipolar or multipolar neurite outgrowths. And we see this starting right away at day one in culture. And it becomes more and more extensive and sophisticated out to two weeks and beyond. Uh, the I cell neurons have been determined to be a mixture of both inhibitory GABAergic and excitatory glutamatergic neurons. And as you can see here, a gene expression and phenotypic analysis, that they have been analyzed uh, for characteristic molecular markers, including synaptophysin and PSD95, et cetera. So something that really sets CDI apart is that these cells can be reproducibly, reproducibly manufactured at a large um, industrial scale quantity with low lot-to-lot -lot variability. And this is important because it has enabled the successful implementation of iCell neurons in a wide range of functional assays. So basically, all of that means, and this slide is here to tell you that these cells are what we say they are, okay? Um, but one feature that I did not mention on this slide, one feature of iCell neurons, is that they are actually an electrically active cell type. And by electrically active, I mean that they can fire action potentials as a mean to drive cell-to-cell -cell communication. And at the risk of grossly oversimplifying what is going on here, 
neuroscientists are really very interested in listening to what the cells are saying when they're in culture. And the prime methodology for studying neuronal connectivity is to use multi-electrode array technology or MEA technology. So MEAs are grids of tightly spaced electrodes. And these electrodes are capable of directly sensing changes in voltage that are propagated down the membranes of excitable cells. And these extracellular single unit recordings are non-invasive and label free. And it's important to point out that single unit means uh, a given electrode can capture and distinctly isolate the action potentials from a single firing neuron. And moreover, as you'll see, MEA makes it possible to really detect neuronal network phenomena through these single unit recordings. So we've been working with neurons on MEA for two to three years now, and we have struck up a nice collaboration with a company called Axion Biosystems based in Atlanta, Georgia. And we really like their MEA system, known as the Maestro. And that's featured here in the upper left on this slide. And it has a very small footprint on the bench, and the software interface is very nice, and it gives you you know, real-time data that is you know, helpful and gratifying at the same time. You know what's going on in your experiment. But what's truly great about the setup is that it has um, 48 wells per MEA plate. And in each of the different wells, there are 16 electrodes. And if you do the math, that totals up to be 768 total electrodes. And because this system has a nice sampling rate of 12.5 kilohertz, you know, that enables the collection of data at really a mind-boggling rate of 9.6 million data points per second. And that is a lot of power, right? And it'll really get any electrophysiologist, electrophysiologist excited to run an experiment, you know, and try to decipher the electrical language of action potentials that those neurons are speaking. So, and uh, the data that is pictured here is actually a little bit older now, right? But it is certainly representative of what's, what occurs when you treat isocell neurons with gabazine. And we'll talk a little bit more about that molecule uh, in this webinar. But, you know, now there may be a chance that some of the attendees on this webinar have already seen this data before, but we included it, uh, to again, to establish some contrast. And I say that because there's really, you know, we are experiencing the dawn of a new era here at CDI when it comes to neuron MEA. And there's, of course, a lot of interest in the field about neuro uh, neurological disorders, and the use of disease-specific IPS lines. And we have really, at CDI, committed effort and resources in this area. Um, and right now, it starts with this presentation, right, that basically <coughs> serves to inform our customers, both new and old, that we have an updated method for thawing and plating and culturing I-cell neurons on a 48-well MEA plate. And uh, these improvements have led not only to an increased neuronal activity and network connectivity, but also a better understanding of what's going on in those neuronal cultures after they've been poked and prodded in chemical space. And to do all of this well, we realized that we needed some more sophisticated tools for analysis. And so that's why we hired someone like Kyle Mangan out of the neuroscience department from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, he is a PhD scientist with extensive experience, meaning double-digit years of experience with neuron MEA. And fortunately, he is also quite proficient in that lab coding. So we've been working together since last fall and together with other members of our applications team to really refine the neuron MEA assay. And I just wanted to take another slide or two to showcase some of the highlights of this method. And so first of all, the assay workflow here is just about one week long, right? After the ISO neurons are thawed and plated, you really only need to perform two media changes and you're good to go on day eight post-thaw. And speaking of thawing, we formatted this so that one vial of cryopreserved cells is used per one 48-well MEA plate. And we put down a high-density dot of neurons in the middle of each well, and we have optimized really each step of the assay uh, to ensure success. So this is what an MEA plate looks like after, you're, after you complete dotting, and you can see that um, each well has a, has a dot right in the center of that, and then we fill those wells up with media, and we wait for a few days and change it a couple of times and look at the activity on the plate. And 
here you go, whoa, right? You can see here on this real-time activity heat map, you know, one of the nice features of the Axion MEA software um, is that nearly every electrode here in this 6 by 8 grid uh, is showing activity. And if you zoom in and look even more closely at one well and see the activity on all 16 electrodes in that single well, you know, this is the raw data. It's a trace of the voltage changes. And you can observe spontaneous action potentials occurring at, through all these electrodes. Okay? But we really needed to be able to turn that heat map and these spikes into numbers and graphs that we could better understand and utilize. So now this is where we introduce CDI's new approach to the neuron MEA analysis. We call it the iCell Neural Analyzer. And this is the point where I finish and I turn it over to Kyle to let him do his thing and show you how this tool can be used to augment your research. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Kobe. Uh, Kobe Carlson, manager of the apps team here at CDI. Uh, I really appreciated your guidance and, and uh, bringing me on board here. Uh, uh, shout out to all the CDI people. Uh, I really think that's pretty, uh, it's awesome to be part of this group. Also need to give a, a, some recognition to my um, graduate advisor, uh, Dr. Matthew Jones, because he did some of the original coding uh, here uh, with this anal analysis tool. And, uh, you know, so obviously I'm here to introduce this iCell Neural Analyzer. You know, it's a, it, ultimately it's a straightforward, quick, and effective way to assess how in vitro neuronal networks respond to pharmacological perturbation. Before I go on any farther, I'm actually going to uh, go back one slide. And, you know, I hope everybody gets the idea of, of how nice and, and how effective our protocol has been developed here. I mean, having activity on every one of these electrodes and, and almost the entire um, uh, plate is, you know, this is a great baseline of activity. And so the idea of the ISO neural analyzer is to, to look at this baseline activity and then uh, hit it with some pharmacology and see how that activity changes, right? And you, obviously in order to do that, you need a good baseline of activity. And, and you can see here we've really you know, everybody working at CDI has, has optimized this um, protocol, and, and it looks pretty good. So with that said, again, I'm here to uh, introduce the ISO Neural Analyzer. It's a, um, you know, it works in, our, uh, in conjunction to the Axion Maestro uh, system. It's a MATLAB-based app, and uh, it's going to give you a lot of outputs. As you can see down at the bottom, that's just a couple of them, and we'll get to uh, talk about those in specifically in the future. But uh, it's pretty easy to use, and uh, hopefully you guys uh, will, will appreciate it at, at times in here. Uh, so the ISO Neural Analyzer is is pretty nice because you can uh, you can do uh, a quick eight day. And then uh, you can look at minimal, you know, it's a minimal workload. And ultimately on day eight, you hit it with some pharmacology. And you can see here it's a four-minute recording pre and then a, and a four-minute recording post. And uh, you set up this system so that you have three recordings. Um, but ultimately the middle recording is going to have a bunch of artifacts because that's where you add the pharmacological agent. And so we don't actually want to uh, analyze that portion. Um, so we, we do a four-minute pre-recording. And then we add some drug, and then we do a four-minute post-recording, and ultimately the ISO Neural Analyzer will compare these two recordings for, for multiple um, variables that I will get into specifically. Um, in this talk, uh, and, and through my research, we've investigated uh, many different pharmacological agents, including excitatory, uh, mediating agents, acanic acid, uh, as, as people should know, um, activates NMDA and AMPA receptors, which are the, the dominant excitatory neurotransmitter receptors. Uh, AP5 you can use uh, to block NMDA receptor activation, and DNQX will block AMPA receptor activation. We will also investigated uh, a general um, inhibitory blocker, gabazine, which will block all uh, GABAergic receptor activity. We've also investigated uh, a drug that selectively blocks extrasynaptic GABA uh, receptors. Ultimately, L655708 will um, cause a, a slight depolarization in the membrane potential and make cell types that express a certain GABA receptor um, subtype to become uh, more excitable. Uh, we 
also uh, have investigated um, selective synaptic um, compounds, including a cannabinoid receptor agonist uh, that in cortical neurons uh, ultimately um, should increase the, fight, uh, the release of uh, glutamatergic agents, and then laminin, which is a prosynaptic um, structure molecule. So now to get into the meat a little bit of, of what's going on here, you can see this is the uh, an actual video of what's um, the running heat map on the Axion Maestro system. And um, you know this heat map is a readout of the spiking frequency. Uh, it, it has all 16 electrodes on it uh, that are that are shown with higher action potential frequency being designated with uh, lighter colors. And so this is a nice visual readout, but there's not much we can do about it. Um, but the system, as it goes through, will capture all of those. The Axion uh, software will capture all of those action potentials and then uh, produce a um, pretty much a list of spike times. And if you take that and import that into MATLAB and then you put it into a raster plot type of uh, distribution, you can see, um, which is up here, hopefully most of uh, this is kind of uh, something that people have seen before. We have time on the, on the uh, x-axis designated by a 50-second bar that's here. And then we have all 16 electrodes, 1 through 16 on the left-hand side on the, x on the y axis. And then as you can see here, um, action potential uh, tick marks for an action potential that happened on that specific electrode as time went by. And uh, you know, ultimately, you can see there's a lot of activity on all the 16 electrodes. We have uh, been able to get about 83% of, of electrodes active with the, the current protocol for, for thawing and dotting. So as you can see, um, before, so uh, to orient you here a little bit, so this on the left-hand side is, is kind of the, the resting state of the, of the network activity, number of action potentials occurring, especially like on electrodes 15 and 16 and, and on two here, right? And then right here is where I added a drug. In this case, it was gabazine. And you can see that after the gabazine addition, uh, the, the profile of the firing types kind of changed uh, across all electrodes here. And ultimately, the isolinear analyzer will take a, a snapshot of what happens in this portion, a snapshot of what happens in this portion, and then it will compare the two, and uh, um, so on and so forth. So if you were to collapse uh, all of the fire, all the action potentials across the entire well down and, and concatenate them together, you could get a, a rolling mean firing rate of the entire well, right? And so ultimately what we can do here to, to try to parse out this activity is, is bend the firing rates in different, in different ways. And so for instance, if you have a 600 second long recording, a 10 minute recording, and you bend it in, in 300 seconds, you'd have two spots, two, two graphs, if you bend it in 30-second bins, in, in other words, if you put the number of action potentials that occurred in 30-second bins, and then you graph those as, as time went on, you could get some uh, activity like this. If you do that down, and ultimately we do it down to 500 millisecond bins, you get uh, kind of a rolling mean firing rate for the entire um, uh, well's activity. And as you can see here, you know, for the most part, the mean firing rate is kind of stable kept at about 10 hertz or so, but you can see that there's uh, increases and decreases of the mean firing rate, and, uh, and especially here where we have the artifact, you have an increase in the, in the, in, in the mean firing rate that, that um, uh, results after the drug addition, and you have a little bit of a, of a loss of activity. And then afterwards, when the, when the network decides to become more normal uh, and, and kind of gets past the drug addition level, you can see that the, the frequency of these uh, of the mean firing rate of the well within that 500 milliseconds uh, is increased compared to what it was prior to, right? So um, ultimately, uh, this is one portion uh, that uh, the isolinear neuro analyzer will use to compare before and after conditions. And to, um, you know, this, this uh, is ultimately a, a velocity graph. And uh, this, velocity, this velocity graph, uh, as I mentioned, is, is used to depict the, the rolling mean fire rate as time goes on. And so um, the algorithm that uh, I've used to analyze this data um, ultimately captures uh, peaks and, and, and thresholds 
of these increased intensity momentary bursts of activity. And uh, so the algorithm goes through and it, and it designates, uh, as you can see here with the red circles, it designates a peak frequency for each for a, for a burst. It also designates a, a threshold frequency that happened just prior to that burst. And then ultimately it, it does mul multiple things, but in one situation you can think about it, 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 it looks at the, at the difference in the change in the frequency of this uh, of the distance of the burst, and as long as that frequency change is, is above a certain threshold, in this case I've made it a, a 16 hertz, then it captures that and calls that a burst event, right? So this is uh, ultimately we're capturing excitatory high firing rate activities uh, that are happening within the entire well itself, and uh, so then we can uh, capture the number of red circles. Uh, we can also capture the the size of the intensity uh, of these uh, of these bursts, and we can also compare uh, and we can also capture the the overall mean fire rate of the well. And so ultimately, uh, the eye cell neuro analyzer will, will compare these three conditions before and after. And so we have here the three conditions that are compared: the mean firing rate the bursting rate, and then the intensity within the burst, right? And so we've designated it to label these things as far as the change in the mean firing rate from before and after uh, pharmacological perturbations, we have the influence on inhibition. We just easily could have called this the influence on excitation. However, the bursting rate is captured by these red circles is, is a direct measure of the excitation, so we decided to, to designate that as the influence on excitation. So therefore, we're left with the influence on inhibition for the change in the mean firing rate. And then again, this, this frequency distance between the threshold and the peak frequency, we designate it as the influence on connectivity, because you can imagine um, if, if the, there's stronger connectivity as far as synaptic connectivity goes, then uh, when one cell fires, another will fire, and if that's happening uh, at a substantially better connectivity activity level, then you'll get more firing rates and the intensity will be higher. So these measures, uh, unlike just, you know, looking at raster plots or, or, or looking at the velocity graphs, these measures are actually quantitative marks. And, and thus, it, it's this that the ICL neuroanalyzer used to, um, is used to compare and contrast the two, the two uh, conditions. So as mentioned, we have uh, the velocity graphs, the three conditions that we measure. Uh, then we have the compare and contrast, the pre versus post recordings. And ultimately what you can then do is the isomer analyzer will compare these conditions and create a graph, for instance, like this one right here, where we have on the left-hand side, we have the, the, the mean fire rates designated as before and after with these blue bars. So you can see in this control condition, we have a, a before mean fire rate of around 2.5 hertz. Uh, after the drug has been added, or in this case, the control situation is, is just adding media, um, we have, again, the firing rate, uh, the mean firing rate is around 2.5 hertz. So this is the difference within each well before and after drug addition, and uh, that's what we designate as the influence on inhibition. Likewise, in the center here, we have the, the, the change or the difference in the bursting rates before and after, and then the change designated with the green bar here. And then, uh, so here on the right-hand side is the connectivity marks, and this is the threshold and peak frequencies. Let me orient you here. So the white bar up to the white bar is where the threshold frequency is uh, for the entire population prior to drug. And then uh, this top of the blue line is the peak frequency. This dotted line is a recapitulation of the mean firing rate. And then ultimately you're comparing the size of the uh, blue bar here, so that's the distance between the threshold frequency and the peak frequency, and how this changes uh, before and after drug addition, and that gives us the connectivity mark uh, designated in blue. So this is a within wells comparison. Um, you know, this is not uh, all the wells are average for mean fire rate. This is one well has a mean fire rate before the drug, one ha and that same well has a change in the mean fire rate, and that change is what's designated as the influence on inhibition, right? So it's a, it's a pretty strong measure. Um, and again, these differences for each influence are quantifiable and can, uh, uh, you know, therefore you can change from visual inspection into actual statistics. So as an example here, um, let's show you some uh, velocity graphs from some uh, recordings. So here we have two wells, and on the top well, uh, both wells show good activity prior to drug addition. And then on the top wall, you can see that after application of AP5, which is going to be blocking NMDA receptors, 
we see after normal, uh, you know, a recalibration of the activity levels, we can see um, that the overall mean firing rate has gone down, um, possibly the number of red circles, so the bursts, the number of bursts has gone down, possibly the size of the burst has gone down, you know, uh, you know, so there's obviously, when you block NMDA receptor activation, there's a decrease in the overall network activity, right? So we can visually see that, and that's nice. Uh, likewise, you block with DNQX, so you're going to be blocking AMPA receptor uh, activation, and, and AMPA receptors are really dominant on, on controlling the excitability of, of uh, synaptic connectivity. And you can see here that after blockage of DNQX, we have a complete, almost a complete cessation of activity, and, uh, you know, maybe there's no bursts going on at all. And again, visually, we can inspect this stuff and say that there's effects going on. However, the nice thing about the iCell neuroanalyzer is it actually quantifies these marks, right? So we can see before, uh, again, uh, to, to orient you, this is the mean firing rate before and after, this is the bursting rate before and after, and then the connectivity mark before and after for, for this specific drug, AP5. We can see that the uh, mean firing rate went down, which results in an increase in the in it influence on inhibition. The bursting rate went down, which is a decrease in the excitation, and the size of the bursts also went down. So we have a decrease in the connectivity mark. This kind of makes sense for, you know, we're, we're blocking an excitatory receptor, uh, so these these kind of results are expected. And it kind of looks like that's what visually happens. Uh, furthermore, the DNQX condition, we block more. Uh, of the mean fire rate, so the influence on inhibition is even higher. The uh, influence on excitation is, is very substantially uh, decrease, and then there's no actual um, uh, bursts that occur after the drug is added, so there's no condition to compare here. And uh, so we can ultimately say that blocking NMDA activity is uh, substantially affects the network behavior, except for it doesn't affect it actually to the level that blocking with the NQX does, so, so that's good. Um, so another nice, uh, nice point about this is we can uh, use uh, the, the 48 wells to our advantage that uh, are in this uh, MEA um, plate, and we can assess multiple concentrations of a drug on one MEA plate, and therefore we can see how network behavior changes uh, uh, change across many different concentrations of pharmacology. Ultimately, we can get a dose response curve in the network resulting from uh, a, a selected so when we do something like that, um, we can uh, ultimately produce graphs similar to this. So to orient you guys here, um, this is the, the graphs on the left-hand side are the influence on inhibition. The graphs in the middle are the influence on excitation. And the graphs on the right are the influence on connectivity. And so what we're doing here is doing some pharmacological uh, um, manipulation in order to selectively block amphoreceptor uh, activity. And then on the bottom, we're going to selectively activate uh, ampere receptor activity. So if I'll, I'll walk you through uh, on the top. So as we increase the amounts of uh, and the concentrations in the wells of DNQX, we can see that uh, blocking uh, more and more of, of ampere receptor activity um, causes maybe some slight uh, increase in the influence on inhibition, but uh, uh, it, it's not significant, but there might be a trend there. Uh, in the influence on connectivity, there's not much of a change going on. However, if you look at the influence on excitation, we get a dose-dependent decrease in excitation as we increase the DNQX concentration. Right? So as we're blocking more and more of the AMPA receptor, we're, uh, we're dose-dependently blocking excitation, which kind of seems to make a little sense. And likewise, if we go down on the, on the bottom graphs here, so here we are adding a blanket amount of AP5, which is going to block NMDA receptors, and then we're going to add increasing concentrations of canic acid. So we, uh, canic acid will um, activate any excitatory synapse, um, including NMDA and AMPA receptors. However, in this case, we're blocking with AP5. So we are uh, selectively activating AMPA receptors. And as you can see here, the influence on inhibition, again, changes slightly, uh, although it's not significant. The influence on connectivity doesn't change much. However, now when we look at the excitability mark, the influence on excitability, we see that there's a dose-dependent increase in the number of, uh, of, of bursts in this case, and, and therefore an increase in the influence on excitation. So in one case, we're blocking AMPA receptor activation, and in another case, we're activating AMPA receptor activation, and we get inverse remarks. So this kind of argues that the system seems to be um, 
acting appropriately, A, and B, that the ISO neuroanalyzer is assessing the um, network activity appropriately too. So ultimately, what we can do is we can put all three of these graphs uh, onto the same graph and, and, and designate each influence by color. So uh, there's a lot of information that's going to be going on and, and uh, is present here on this, on this slide, but let me walk you through it. First of all, let me orient you to the way that the graphs are laid out. So again, we, we put all three of the influences on the same graph, and so we have a, a concentration-dependent graph here with gabazine. And, uh, and we have the red line is the influence on inhibition, the green line is the influence on excitation, and the blue line is the influence on connectivity, right? And so you can see as the concentration of gabazine increases here, what we see is we see a selective increase in the uh, influence on excitation, right? So we're, gabazine is gonna be blocking all GABA-A receptors, so it's pretty much blocking all inhibition, and therefore the, uh, uh, the excitatory measure increases um, uh, it's pretty much at the beginning here, but it increases across all conditions. So that's one experiment, um, and we replicated that in-house, and the second experiment run on a different day, uh, multiple weeks apart, and we have, again, an increasing amount of gabazine on the y-axis, and uh, again, we see that there's a dose-dependent increase in the excitatory mark, right? So, so hopefully you guys are oriented to these graphs, and then B, uh, we've shown you that, it, that this analysis type is, is reproducible and can uh, recapitulate previous experiments, right? So now if we, uh, and I mentioned earlier about the pharmacology um, and, and how um, we, we did some interesting pharmacology, we can look over here down on the bottom on the left. And down here we have uh, uh, this uh, graph of the different influences and, and a concentration uh, curve for uh, WIN55 which is um, a cannabinoid receptor agonist, and ultimately in cortical neurons, uh, activating cannabinoid receptors uh, has been shown to increase the release of glutamate. And so here what we see is uh, um, there's a selective increase definitely in this blue line, which is uh, the connectivity mark. So it's a dose-dependent increase in the connectivity of the system, and uh, this also is followed with an increase in the excitability mark and a slight decrease in the inhibition mark. This is not a, a huge uh, effect, um, but it is significant in a two-way ANOVA, and it is in the general direction that we would expect it to be for, for you know, increasing the release of excitatory neurotransmitter from, from the presynaptic terminal. Moving up to the graph right above that, we have uh, this drug L655708, which similar to the graphs right above here for gabazine, it is going to block some GABA-A receptors. However, it's not going to block all GABA-A receptors. It's only going to block extrasynaptic GABA-A receptors that express alpha-5 um, subunit GABA-A receptors specifically. And in this case, what we can see is a biphasic result of the concentration-dependent uh, dosing. So what we, uh, the lower doses of L655 appear to uh, increase the connectivity mark and the excitatory mark. However, uh, if you follow the inhibitory, the influence on inhibition mark, as you increase the dosing of L655, you kind of start to walk up this ladder of inhibition, and, um, and ultimately what you're doing is you're exciting the inhibitory cells that are in these cultures, and they are dominating the culture and ultimately styling it, in, it completely as you see a drop in the excitation and the connectivity mark. Now, this brings me to a point that we need to understand, and that is that in these cultures, um, unlike primary rat cultures or, or, or mouse cultures, this, this uh, is a, obviously it's still a mixed population, but it's only neurons, and it's actually 30, 70 glutamatergic to GABAergic ratios, um, which means that when you stimulate excitation in these cultures, you actually are driving inhibition downstream. This is uh, easily pointed out here on the bottom graph on the left. So here, if we give AMPA, uh, which is going to be selectively activating AMPA receptors, and ultimately this is thought to stimulate excitatory synapses. As we do that in increasing doses, we actually see a decrease in the connectivity mark, a decrease in the excitatory mark, and an increase in the inhibitory mark. 
Ultimately, that is because we're driving excitation, which is uh, thus driving a large portion of the GABAergic population, and that is silencing the cultures as a whole. Now, I've done a lot of investigation to, to parse out this, this fact, and so up here on the right-hand side is, is one example of that. So here we have um, uh, canic acid being added, which is going to be similar to the, to the AMPA, uh, but you're going to be stimulating AMPA receptors and NMDA receptors, and in the case of the lowest concentration, and then I'm going to give increasing amounts of gabazine, right? So I'm going to be, I'm going to be stimulating excitation, and then slowly but surely I'm going to be blocking inhibition, right? And so what we can see is that at the six micromolar canic acid treatment, we can see that the, uh, the first result has a really low excitation mark, the connectivity mark is down, the inhibitory mark is up, right? So when we're driving inhibition, sorry, when we're driving excitation with canic acid, we're, we're silencing the system pretty much. And then as I slowly add gabazine in a dose-dependent way, we are uh, releasing the brakes and we're allowing that canic acid compound to be more excitatory, and so you can see that we end up with higher levels of excitation and connectivity and a lower mark of inhibition. And uh, so this, this system is a little bit flipped in, as far as ac, uh, responses go to primary rat cultures or, or primary uh, mouse cultures, but again, we have to be reminded that this, this culture is uh, strictly a neuronal culture, and again, that the, the ratios are more of a 30-70. It doesn't make it impossible to understand the, the, uh, the readout, but it does make it, you know, we have to pay a little bit more attention and figure out what, what, we're, um, what we're observing. So the main output of the iCell neuroanalyzer, um, obviously you can make these graphs and, 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 and whatnot, but the main output of the iCell neuroanalyzer is actually this wonderful uh, 3D version of those graphs that I was just uh, walking you through. So. What we can see here is we can see, again, this is the L655 condition. Here is the cannabinoid receptor, this WIN drug. And then there's potassium chloride, which I, uh, I also had on the previous graph. And then to orient you to these graphs, what, uh, uh, what you can see is that you have the different influences here, uh, with the red line being the influence on inhibition, the green line being the influence on excitation, and the blue line is the influence on connectivity. We, from, uh, from In this case, in this 3D graph, going from left to right, you have increasing amounts of the, uh, the compound, and then we have changes in, in the response before and after uh, with positive changes in the upward direction and, and negative changes in the downward direction. Um, so it's just getting yourself a little bit more oriented to this type of 3D output. It's a little bit flash here, so that's what we decided to do. Um, and, uh, but I would like to also point out uh, we've really taken our time to investigate how different pharmacology could be um, altering the, the network behavior of these cultures and also how that uh, perturbation could be assessed with this iCell neuroanalyzer and to see if it was working correctly. So one of the ways, one of the things we did was we looked at different laminin variants. And in this case, it's not a concentration dose dependent curve, it's just actually seven different, um, uh, different types of laminin. Uh, the, the, the zero here is actually our control laminin that we that we use all the time. And then in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five, six uh, different laminin types. And again, we can see that the influences uh, are here in red, green, and blue. And selectively, this laminin is supposed to be um, different laminin variants uh, help um, physically connect synapses uh, either more or less, um, or maybe certain types of synapses. And in this case, what we can see is that with the different types of uh, laminin, we see selectively uh, an increase in either the connectivity mark and uh, or the excitation mark. There's absolutely no change in the overall mean firing rates of these different laminin, but we definitely see that there's an increase in the blue uh, ribbon or in the green ribbon. And ultimately, maybe, uh, you know, as I mentioned, uh, the, the zero here is what we use currently in our product and we and in our protocols, but maybe maybe we should move to this number four, Kobe, because it's got a little bit larger excitation and connectivity marks. But this, we'll we'll have to think about this in the future. So the uh, the other nice thing we've done is we've actually been able to do a a beta test, and so we've sent it out to to a couple of of customers that have been nice enough to test this out, 
and uh, they, we've actually gotten one to return the results to us, and it seems to be very reproducible uh, across the country. So this is good, right? So this is, on the left-hand side, this is our 3D graphs that, that, that get produced, and um, so this is the in-house data for gabazine, and again, the influences of the different colors, and then the gabazine concentration is increasing from left to right. And then we can see how the gabazine concentrations all uh, specifically are increasing the excitatory measures in these cultures. And then so here is an external lab um, data that we just got returned to us. And we can see in this other lab that um, the same thing occurs. Gabazine uh, ultimately increases in the excitatory component. And, and oddly enough, it's actually at the same levels. Not oddly, I should say excitingly enough, it's at the same levels that we saw it. They actually maybe have even a nicer uh, uh, response in the connectivity blue bar here that's a nice dose-dependent increase in that connectivity mark. So um, that's nice that things, uh, they, they, you know, there's similar profiles and responses to pharmacology and that the ISIL neuroanalyzer has been able to um, replicate this across the country. Um, the ISIL neuroanalyzer, as mentioned, is, a, is nice, quick, easy uh, steps. So there's pretty much uh, five steps. The, the Axion software, as I mentioned, will, um, will parse out action potentials and produce a, a, a spikes file that has a list of all the action potentials for every well and every electrode. And uh, that's captured. And uh, I have two examples here. Uh, so the, the Axion Maestro will acquire all the data and, and, and produce a spikes file. It's about five makes big, which is uh, a lot better than the raw data. The raw data is about a thousand times larger than this, so it's nice that this spike file is created, makes it a workable size for us. And so here we have, uh, in this case, you can see I've labeled it gabazine and day eight, my initials and the plate, and then it comes out to zero, 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 right? Because we have three recordings. We have a pre-recording, a, a during the drug application, and then a post-recording. So. Here I have the two files I'm interested in, the pre-recording and then the same file name with the 002. Obviously, 001 is the, where the drug was added. We don't use that one to compare. We use the pre and the post. So we have these two files, and we acquire those off the Axion software. Then we go to MATLAB, and once we've installed the ISIL Neuroanalyzer app, we go underneath the Apps tab, and we click this icon that says ISIL Neuroanalyzer. Once we click the icon, a window will pop up, and it looks like this, and there'll be a, a designation to load the baseline file, and, and, and you push browse, and you map yourself to this 000 file, and then you have the comparison file, and you browse, and you map yourself to the 002 file. This also gives you the option to change the bin width if you'd like, um, but I, I suggest that we keep it at 500 milliseconds for now, but you can obviously change that if you, if you wish. Then you press run, once you press run, this window will pop up. And at present time, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a neuroscientist, and I do have some MATLAB skills, but I'm not, uh, you know, it's not my uh, main job. So I've, I've limited at the moment with this app to being column designating different concentrations. So hopefully maybe in the future we'll be able to, to get a, a complete um, plate layout and, and map designation for different wells, but at the present time we have uh, different concentrations that are designated for different columns. So in this case, the, uh, this, this window that pops up, you have column one through eight, and you can see here I have column one as control and column eight as control, and then as I go from seven, six, five in the different columns, I have increasing amounts of gabazine, right? And so here I name it down on the bottom, gabazine and micromolar. I say yes, put the error bars on, that's for uh, one of the outputs. And then I press uh, go, or you, and then, you, then you press OK, and then you go get a cup of coffee. And after uh, a couple minutes, depending on how much uh, data there is to analyze, it'll, it'll produce a graph on your screen that looks like this, um, which is the 3D uh, version of all those graphs I was showing you earlier. But not only does it produce this graph, this 3D version of the graph, it also produces a lot of other outputs. Ultimately, it produces about, uh, I'd say, about three um, gigs of, of, of analysis. So uh, every well that is in the plate will have a raster plot produced for it before and after. Mm -hmm. Every well will also have a velocity graph um, before and after. And uh, both of these are, are saved as TIFF files, but also as MATLAB files, in case you want to use those for, for later analysis. Um, 
Every condition before and after will have place statistics laid out in a six by eight grid here. And so you'll have the mean firing rate before and after, the, the bursting rates before and after. And uh, then you will also have column comparison statistics. And so hopefully this, this small version of the graph, and you have the mean firing rate on the left, the, the burst in the, in the center, and then the, the connectivity on the right. And so this will be jump, uh, produced for all eight columns. And then a network fingerprint uh, graph will be produced that's ultimately a recapitulation of these 3D graphs. But also an Excel spreadsheet can be, is made, and you can use that data to then move over to a PRISM file or, or, or graph as, as you see fit. So there's a lot of outputs that, are, that occur, but uh, there's a lot of data to be analyzed, and obviously it's, it's interesting and, and uh, And you know, I still uh, spent some time to make these pretty pictures, so you, know, you can also use those to put in your in, in grants and whatnot, and, and make people kind of impressed with the data. But obviously, all these other outputs you can use to analyze and, and, and look at the data is in very um, uh, normal way that people are used to seeing things. So the idea here is to utilize the power that uh, the human IPS cells offer, you know, the, us researchers and, and, and investigation. To, you know, screen drugs for the influences on brain activity, you know, including toxicity and, and, de and cell death, you know, but this hopefully the ice cell neuroanalyzer can expand that to, to look at the influences on, on brain inhibition, excitatory levels, and, and connectivity influences as well. Um, hopefully platforms like, uh, you know, the Axia Maestro system and, and the tool like this iCell Neuroanalyzer can ultimately help uh, discover pharmacological agents that, that can help with epilepsies and psychiatric disorders and uh, many associated memory associated disorders. And so, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the goal here. I, I'm pretty excited about it. I've been working on it since I walked in the door about six uh, months ago. And uh, so, Finally, I appreciate everybody uh, that, that joined in and has been listening to me for the last uh, 30 minutes or so. Um, now I'm going to uh, give you a farewell and, and give it back to Kobe and then meet back up for some questions and answers. Great, great, perfect. All right, so I hope everyone can appreciate uh, Kyle's work and his interest and enthusiasm in this. And this slide will just summarize real quick what's happening, you know, what the, went through today in the webinar. So first, human iPSC-derived neurons, or i.e. the I-cell neurons, can be measured on MEA, right? And the Maestro MEA system from Axion really provides a high-throughput approach to recording neuronal activity. Um, and you can see that we've developed an assay to measure the effects of drugs on the neurons, you know, pre- and post-treatment. And we're using this I-cell neuroanalyzer tool as a powerful method to, you know, understand what's going on. And, and you know, simple things about it, it's a MATLAB-based uh, code packaged as an app. It's really, as Kyle demonstrated, fairly easy to use. Just five steps from loading the spiked files after you record on the instrument and to your results. And, you know, th I think a big theme that you sh should have grasped from this is that there are many different types of outputs, right? Um, and we've provided from raster plots to very uh, elegant 3D ribbon plots, right? So there's a lot of nice stuff in there to really help you understand what's going on. And so as we finish up here, no, sort of our final thoughts, just another way to summarize what's going on. You know, CDI is, hopefully we've showed, you know, one of the leading manufacturers in iPSC-derived cell types. And it's not only of neurons, but it's of other neuronal cell types, astrocytes, dopaminergic neurons, or neuronal cell types derived from other donors. Um, and, you know, we're working really hard to develop protocols for all these cells to be able to be tested on the MEA. And Axion is really leading the way with this technology. Um, and soon they're going to be expanding from 48 wells to 96 wells, and it's really going to increase the throughput on this even more. So we think, um, you know, marrying these two technologies is really the future direction of looking at uh, neuronal activity on MEA. But as we've shown here, hopefully, one of the pieces of the puzzle that we're missing are the analysis. And the ISO neuroanalyzer really can bridge that gap, right? And, you know, you have the neurons on the MEA, and you're measuring their action potentials and, you know, quote, unquote, trying to listen to them. Well, this helps you decipher what's going on. 
Um, and I know this is kind of cheesy, but you know this is where you will be right, right here in the middle if you use these things all together. That's kind of the idea of this. Um, so that's the take-home message of our webinar today. Thank you for joining. Right? If you have any questions, uh, we're receiving them now. And if you want to follow up with anything afterwards, you can please contact our technical support group. You can find more out about the product on our webpage. You can email us at support at cellulardynamics.com. You could be uh, very old school and traditional or use the phone, call us right up. And you know, here are the different things. You know, what you need to, to do this is you need iCell neurons, you need an MEA system, and something here to uh, analyze the iCell neuroanalyzer app. Okay, so we have had a few questions come in, and uh, the first one that we're going to answer is, um, have you tested the iCell neuroanalyzer with other cell types, such as primary neurons or co-culture with astrocytes on the NEA? And so the answer to that is, um, yes, we have analyzed several other cell types on the MEA, including dopaminergic neurons, you know, various micelle neurons, like I said, you know, cell neurons from a different donor, and even rat primary cortical neurons. Um, and we're working to optimize a co-culture procedure on this as well. Um, the activity can be measured and assessed with all those different neuronal cell types uh, using this tool, but really it was designed and optimized with the iCell neurons, which are a highly pure population of cells free of any astrocytes or glial cells. So we're very interested to see, you know, what the impacts are of co-culture, what happens when you have different subtypes, meaning DA neurons versus cortical neurons, and um, uh, what happens if you have uh, derived neurons from different iPSC donors. Okay? So the next question that we have here is how much does the iCell neuroanalyzer cost? And actually, um, that's a good question. The app is free. And, you know, to do this experiment, you obviously need a lot of other things, including iPSC derived neurons, an MEA system, MATLAB software for this, but we provide you with this packaged app that you plug into MATLAB and it can help you for the analysis. Right. And the best way, as you can see on the slide, to get this at the moment is to email us directly to get this version of the ICEL Neuroanalyzer, um, and we distribute that from our technical support group. Um, let's see, another question that we have here is, uh, can I get additional help or instructions about the handling and plating of cells, maybe even the analysis prior to starting MEA? for the first time, and the answer to that is, of course, right? Just like with many of our other cell types and assays, we have what we call a getting started deck, and that's a tool that we use to help you hit the ground running. So we will have um, getting started decks for uh, iCell neurons just in general, but also how to use these on the MEA, and then to, for the iCell Neuroanalyzer app, if you'd like to get in touch again with us and speak directly even with Kyle to get into the um, nitty-gritty details of this. All right, let's see. So another question we have is how long uh, have the neurons been differ differentiated before you measure activity? Um, you know, what, again, what you're getting is a, is a terminally differentiated neuronal cell type, right? And it's cryopreserved. And so we have a differentiation protocol that is, you know, approximately a month long, right? The details of that we don't really discuss, but after their thought, we're looking out at the about eight days post-thaw and culture. Um, we have optimized the timing for this to where that's the most consistent uh, and reproducible time to in the earliest time you should measure for pharmacology. We have definitely carried these cells out longer in culture, so you can look at them at day 14, day 21, and perform these same sorts of analyses that way. But we've designed this with the idea of, of testing compounds in mind um, and looking for the earliest um, possible time point to do that. Okay, we're looking through the questions here. Um, one of the questions here is, is there any ability to choose which electrodes or wells to analyze, or is everything pre-specified? Uh, like we said, that you know, there's a lot of power with this MEA system, and there is uh, a 
lot of data that comes off of this. And at the moment, we have, using this analysis tool, um, formatted it, like Kyle said, to where you are looking at eight different conditions on this six by eight grid MEA plate. And so there are eight conditions and six replicates for each one. Um, how you can make that more flexible and change it in the future, that would probably be with um, subsequent versions of this ISO Neuroanalyzer, or perhaps even, uh, you know, integrated with the software for this system perhaps in the future. Uh, someone actually said that they came in late and they wanted to know if there's going to be a pre-recorded, I mean a recorded version of this. Everyone that has been attending this email or has registered, sorry, attending this webinar or has registered will get a follow-up email um, to let you know the website where you can go ahead and link to find the recorded version of this and a copy of the, the PDF copy of the slides that we presented. So um, if you came in late, no problem, you can follow us up and if you want to listen to it over and over again, you can do that as well. Okay. Um, so let's see. I think we have time to maybe take one or two more questions. Um, you know, not everybody, this question is, we don't have an MEA, but is there a service that evaluates the effects of ISO neurons that we can pay for? Um, that's a great idea. Uh, we don't, at CDI, offer a service for profiling compounds, but um, there are other CROs that are looking into this as well. And um, I think off the top of my head, I know that uh, Cipertex is one that is using ICEL neurons on MEA on the same system. And they do it not only with neurons, they do it with cardiomyocytes as well. So um, that's something that you can write us directly and we can help put you in touch with them. But uh, this is where the, the future is going, looking at some of these um, uh, pharmacological responses in a, in a quote unquote service mode, I would think. Okay, um, let's see. The final question here is talking about um, do you have to use the Axion format or can you also read other formats? Um, so I think that question is directed to if you have another type of MEA, do the, does the output from those, is that compatible with this? Um, you know, at the moment we have the code for this ISO Neuroanalyzer app to import the spikes files from the Axion Maestro instrument, but conceptually um, the data that comes off is quite similar. So if you are unable to uh, run an experiment on there, maybe this is something we could talk to you about on how to, um, you know, kind of marry another output with this ISO Neuroanalyzer app. But at the moment, we're, and we really think the advantage of the, the 48 wells and beyond is, is something that why we're focusing specifically on the Axion Maestro. Okay, so thanks a lot. There are some other questions in here that we can follow up uh, via email, um, but we appreciate your time today. Thanks a lot for logging on and listening to our webinar. And